Book One, Part Five of Herodotus Histories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. Histories, Volume One, by Herodotus of Halicarnassus, translated by A. D. Godley. Book One, Part Five, Paragraphs seventy nine to ninety three. When Croesus marched away after the battle in the Pterian country, Cyrus, learning that Croesus had gone intending to disband his army, deliberated and perceived that it would be opportune for him to march quickly against Sardis before the power of the Lydians could be assembled again. This he decided, and this he did immediately. He marched his army into Lydia, and so came himself to bring the news of it to Croesus. All had turned out contrary to Croesus' expectation, and he was in a great quandary. Nevertheless, he led out the Lydians to battle. Now at this time there was no nation in Asia more valiant or warlike than the Lydian. It was their custom to fight on horseback, carrying long spears, and they were skilful at managing horses. So the armies met in the plain, wide and bare, that is before the city of Sardis. The Hillus and other rivers flow across it, and run violently together into the greatest of them, which is called Hermus. This flows from the mountain sacred to the mother Dindimini, and empties into the sea near the city of Phocea. When Cyrus saw the Lydians manoeuvring their battle lines here, he was afraid of their cavalry, and therefore at the urging of one Harpagus, a Mede, he did as I shall describe. Assembling all the camels that followed his army bearing food and baggage, he took off their burdens, and mounted men upon them equipped like cavalrymen. Having equipped them, he ordered them to advance before his army against Croesus' cavalry. He directed the infantry to follow the camels, and placed all his cavalry behind the infantry. When they were all in order, he commanded them to kill all the other Lydians who came in their way, and spare none, but not to kill Croesus himself, even if he should defend himself against capture. Such was his command. The reason for his posting the camels to face the cavalry was this. Horses fear camels, and can endure neither the sight nor the smell of them. This, then, was the intention of his manoeuvre, that Croesus' cavalry, on which the Lydian relied to distinguish himself, might be of no use. So when battle was joined, as soon as the horses smelled and saw the camels, they turned to flight, and all Croesus' hope was lost. Nevertheless the Lydians were no cowards. When they saw what was happening, they leaped from their horses and fought the Persians on foot. Many of both armies fell. At length the Lydians were routed and driven within their city wall, where they were besieged by the Persians. So then they were besieged. But Croesus, supposing that the siege would last a long time, again sent messengers from the city to his allies. Whereas the former envoys had been sent to summon them to muster at Sardis in five months' time, these were to announce that Croesus was besieged, and to plead for help as quickly as possible. So he sent to the Lacedaemonians, as well as to the rest of the allies. Now at this very time the Spartans themselves were feuding with the Argives over the country called Thyrii, for this was a part of the Argive territory which the Lacedaemonians had cut off and occupied. All the land towards the west, as far as Malia, belonged then to the Argives, and not only the mainland, but the island of Cythera and the other islands. The Argives came out to save their territory from being cut off. Then, after debate, the two armies agreed that three hundred of each side should fight, 
and whichever party won would possess the land. The rest of each army was to go away to its own country and not be present at the battle, since if the armies remained on the field, the men of either party might render assistance to their comrades if they saw them losing. Having agreed, the armies drew off, and picked men of each side remained and fought. Neither could gain advantage in the battle. At last only three out of the six hundred were left, Alcina and Chromius of the Argives, Othryades of the Lacedaemonians. These three were left alive at nightfall. Then the two Argives, believing themselves victors, ran to Argos. But Othryades the Lacedaemonian, after stripping the Argive dead and taking the arms to his camp, waited at his position. On the second day both armies came to learn the issue. For a while both claimed the victory, the Argives arguing that more of their men had survived, the Lacedaemonians showing that the Argives had fled, while their man had stood his ground and stripped the enemy dead. At last from arguing they fell to fighting. Many of both sides fell, but the Lacedaemonians gained the victory. The Argives, who before had worn their hair long by fixed custom, shaved their heads ever after, and made a law, with a curse added to it, that no Argive grow his hair, and no Argive woman wear gold, until they recovered Thyrii. And the Lacedaemonians made a contrary law, that they wear their hair long ever after, for until now they had not worn it so. Othryades, the lone survivor of the three hundred, was ashamed, it is said, to return to Sparta after all the men of his company had been killed, and killed himself on the spot at Thyrii. The Sardian herald came after this had happened to the Spartans to ask for their help for Croesus, now besieged. Nonetheless, when they heard the herald, they prepared to send help but when they were already equipped and their ships ready, a second message came that the fortification of the Lydians was taken and Croesus a prisoner. Then, though very sorry indeed, they ceased their efforts. This is how Sardis was taken. When Croesus had been besieged for fourteen days, Cyrus sent horsemen around in his army to promise to reward whoever first mounted the wall. After this the army made an assault, but with no success. Then, when all the others were stopped, a certain Mardian called Hieroeades attempted to mount by a part of the Acropolis where no guard had been set, since no one feared that it could be taken by an attack made here for here the height on which the Acropolis stood is sheer, and unlikely to be assaulted. This was the only place where Meles, the former king of Sardis, had not carried the lion which his concubine had borne him, the Telmessians having declared that if this lion were carried around the walls, Sardis could never be taken. Meles then carried the lion around the rest of the wall of the Acropolis, where it could be assaulted, but neglected this place because the height was sheer and defied attack. It is on the side of the city which faces towards Tumolus. The day before then, Hieroeades, this Mardian, had seen one of the Lydians come down by this part of the Acropolis after a helmet that had fallen down and fetch it. He took note of this and considered it and now he climbed up himself and other Persians after him. Many ascended, and thus Sardis was taken, and all the city sacked. I will now relate what happened to Croesus himself. He had a son, whom I have already mentioned, fine in other respects, but mute. Now in his days of prosperity past, Croesus had done all that he could for his son, and besides resorting to other devices, he had sent to Delphi to inquire of the oracle concerning him. The Pythian priestess answered him thus, Lydian, king of many, greatly foolish Croesus, 
wish not to hear in the palace the voice often prayed for of your son speaking it were better for you that he remain mute as before for on an unlucky day shall he first speak so at the taking of the fortification a certain persian not knowing who croesus was came at him meaning to kill him croesus saw him coming but because of the imminent disaster he was past caring and it made no difference to him whether he was struck and killed but this mute son when he saw the persian coming on in fear and distress broke into speech and cried man do not kill croesus this was the first word he uttered and after that for all the rest of his life he had power of speech the persians gained sardis and took croesus prisoner croesus had ruled fourteen years and been besieged fourteen days fulfilling the oracle he had destroyed his own great empire the persians took him and brought him to cyrus who erected a pyre and mounted croesus atop it bound in chains with twice seven sons of the lydians beside him cyrus may have intended to sacrifice him as a victory offering to some god or he may have wished to fulfil a vow or perhaps he had heard that croesus was pious and put him atop the pyre to find out if some divinity would deliver him from being burned alive so cyrus did this as croesus stood on the pyre even though he was in such a wretched position it occurred to him that solon had spoken with god's help when he had said that no one among the living is fortunate when this occurred to him he heaved a deep sigh and groaned aloud after long silence calling out three times the name solon cyrus heard and ordered the interpreters to ask croesus who he was invoking they approached and asked but croesus kept quiet at their questioning until finally they forced him and he said i would prefer to great wealth his coming into discourse with all despots since what he said was unintelligible they again asked what he had said persistently harassing him he explained that first solon the athenian had come and seen all his fortune and spoken as if he despised it now everything had turned out for him as solon had said speaking no more of him than of every human being especially those who think themselves fortunate while croesus was relating all this the pyre had been lit and the edges were on fire when cyrus heard from the interpreters what croesus said he relented and considered that he a human being was burning alive another human being one his equal in good fortune in addition he feared retribution reflecting how there is nothing stable in human affairs he ordered that the blazing fire be extinguished as quickly as possible and that croesus and those with him be taken down but despite their efforts they could not master the fire then the lydians say that croesus understood cyrus change of heart and when he saw every one trying to extinguish the fire but unable to check it he invoked apollo crying out that if apollo had ever been given any pleasing gift by him let him offer help and deliver him from the present evil thus he in tears invoked the god and suddenly out of a clear and windless sky clouds gathered a storm broke and it rained violently extinguishing the pyre thus cyrus perceived that croesus was dear to god and a good man he had him brought down from the pyre and asked croesus what man persuaded you to wage war against my land and become my enemy instead of my friend he replied o king i acted thus for your good fortune but for my own ill fortune 
the god of the hellenes is responsible for these things inciting me to wage war no one is so foolish as to choose war over peace in peace sons bury their fathers in war fathers bury their sons but i suppose it was dear to the divinity that this be so croesus said this and cyrus freed him and made him sit near and was very considerate to him and both he and all that were with him were astonished when they looked at croesus he for his part was silent deep in thought presently he turned and said for he saw the persians sacking the city of the lydians o king am i to say to you what is in my mind now or keep silent when cyrus urged him to speak up boldly croesus asked the multitude there what is it at which they are so busily engaged they are plundering your city said cyrus and carrying off your possessions no croesus answered not my city and not my possessions for i no longer have any share of all this it is your wealth that they are pillaging cyrus thought about what croesus had said and telling the rest to withdraw asked croesus what fault he saw in what was being done since the gods have made me your slave replied the lydian it is right that if i have any further insight i should point it out to you the persians being by nature violent men are poor so if you let them seize and hold great possessions you may expect that he who has got most will revolt against you therefore do this if you like what i say have men of your guard watch all the gates let them take the spoil from those who are carrying it out and say that it must be paid as a tithe to zeus thus you shall not be hated by them for taking their wealth by force and they recognizing that you act justly will give up the spoil willingly when cyrus heard this he was exceedingly pleased for he believed the advice good and praising him greatly and telling his guard to act as croesus had advised he said croesus now that you a king are determined to act and to speak with integrity ask me directly for whatever favour you like master said croesus you will most gratify me if you will let me send these chains of mine to that god of the greeks whom i especially honoured and to ask him if it is his way to deceive those who serve him well when cyrus asked him what grudge against the god led him to make this request croesus repeated to him the story of all his own aspirations and the answers of the oracles and more particularly his offerings and how the oracle had encouraged him to attack the persians and so saying he once more insistently pled that he be allowed to reproach the god for this at this cyrus smiled and replied this i will grant you croesus and whatever other favour you may ever ask me when croesus heard this he sent lydians to delphi telling them to lay his chains on the doorstep of the temple and to ask the god if he were not ashamed to have persuaded croesus to attack the persians telling him that he would destroy cyrus power of which power they were to say showing the chains these were the first fruits they should ask this and further if it were the way of the greek gods to be ungrateful when the lydians came and spoke as they had been instructed the priestess it is said made the following reply no one may escape his lot not even a god croesus has paid for the sin of his ancestor of the fifth generation before who was led by the guile of a woman to kill his master though he was one of the guard of the heraclidae and who took to himself the royal state of that master to which he had no right and it was the wish of loxias that the evil lot of sardis fall in the lifetime of croesus sons not in his own but he could not deflect the fates 
yet as far as they gave in he did accomplish his wish and favour croesus for he delayed the taking of sardis for three years and let croesus know this that although he is now taken it is by so many years later than the destined hour and further loxias saved croesus from burning but as to the oracle that was given to him croesus is wrong to complain concerning it for loxias declared to him that if he led an army against the persians he would destroy a great empire therefore he ought if he had wanted to plan well to have sent and asked whether the god spoke of croesus or of cyrus empire but he did not understand what was spoken or make further inquiry for which now let him blame himself when he asked that last question of the oracle and loxias gave him that answer concerning the mule even that croesus did not understand for that mule was in fact cyrus who was the son of two parents not of the same people of whom the mother was better and the father inferior for she was a mede and the daughter of astyages king of the medes but he was a persian and a subject of the medes and although in all respects her inferior he married this lady of his this was the answer of the priestess to the lydians they carried it to sardis and told croesus and when he heard it he confessed that the sin was not the gods but his and this is the story of croesus rule and of the first overthrow of ionia there are many offerings of croesus in hellas and not only those of which i have spoken there is a golden tripod at thebes in boeotia which he dedicated to apollo of ismenus at ephesus there are the oxen of gold and the greater part of the pillars and in the temple of pronia at delphi a golden shield all these survived to my lifetime but other of the offerings were destroyed and the offerings of croesus at brancidi of the milesians as i learn by inquiry are equal in weight and like those at delphi those which he dedicated at delphi and the shrine of amphiarius were his own the first fruits of the wealth inherited from his father the rest came from the estate of an enemy who had headed a faction against croesus before he became king and conspired to win the throne of lydia for pantaleon this pantaleon was a son of aliates and half-brother of croesus croesus was aliates son by a carian and pantaleon by an ionian mother so when croesus gained the sovereignty by his father's gift he put the man who had conspired against him to death by drawing him across a carding comb and first confiscated his estate then dedicated it as and where i have said this is all that i shall say of croesus offerings there are not many marvellous things in lydia to record in comparison with other countries except the gold dust that comes down from tmolus but there is one building to be seen there which is much the greatest of all except those of egypt and babylon in lydia is the tomb of aliates the father of croesus the base of which is made of great stones and the rest of it of mounded earth it was built by the men of the market and the craftsmen and the prostitutes there survived until my time five corner stones set on the top of the tomb and in these was cut the record of the work done by each group and measurement showed that the prostitute's share of the work was the greatest all the daughters of the common people of lydia ply the trade of prostitutes to collect dowries until they can get themselves husbands and they themselves offer themselves in marriage now this tomb has a circumference of thirteen hundred and ninety yards and its breadth is above four hundred and forty yards and there is a great lake hard by the tomb which the lydians say is fed by ever-flowing springs it is called the gygean lake 
Such, then, is this tomb. End of Book One, Part Five Recording by Graham Redman